Today on Real Ghost Stories Online, a grandfather returns for a final game of pool. Who's playing with the kids? Oh, it's just our dead grandpa. Those stories and more. Lots of dead grandpa stories today on Real Ghost Stories Online. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. Yes, it is. Phone number. Call it 24 hours a day, seven days a week with your ghost story. 855-853-4802. Right into the website, realghoststoriesonline.com, or email your audio file if you're going to record it on your smart device. Send it to me, Tony, T-O-N-Y, at realghoststoriesonline.com. Website, live dates, all that stuff up there. Want the uh, bonus episodes of the show, those EPP bonus episodes, brand new ones every single week, packed with some of the best stories we got and told in very unique ways. Go to ghostpodcast.com and sign up for that. It's only five bucks a month. That's how we support the show and keep it on the air. So if you like it, please uh, consider doing that. Uh, throwing in your five bucks and getting all, all that extra stuff, advanced episodes of the show, tons of stuff there for you at uh, ghostpodcast.com. Uh, Tony and Carol Hughes joining you once again. And how are you today, Carol? Tony, I'm not bad. You're not bad. I'm not bad. I wanted to say good, and then I'm like, I'm not saying good because that's what I always say. It's downgraded a little bit. Is not 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 bad. It's not quite good. No, I'm actually kind of great because I'm on vacation. Well, there you go. That works. Yeah. <laughs> on vacation in radio, there there really is no such thing technically, though, is there? I mean. Okay, I did work <laughs> some today, but um. <clears throat> It was work that needed to get done. Yeah. But I was at home. Yeah. Well, you know? there you go. It kind of. Yeah. yeah. It's one of those things where it's very much an on-call job, no matter what. And especially if you're in any sort of management of it. That's why I got the hell out of that management roles years ago. Because I felt like even if I wanted to be on vacation, I couldn't. Because it's like, oh, so-and-so can't come in to do their shift today. Can you come do Like, I'm on vacation. Well, there's nobody else. Like, and then That's gone. Great. Yeah. No, I'm actually doing one of those staycations mm -hmm. where you, the idea is you get done all that stuff that yeah. you put off doing. Mm -hmm. And so today was day one, and I did a lot of it. That's so I'm doing. I'm like actually doing what I. But I mean, I have like six more days to screw that up. But <laughs> day one was great. And then by the last day, you're like, uh, I'll get that done in my next vacation. That'll. Uh We'll just put it off till then. It is fulfilling getting the stuff around the house done. I was trying to do some of that over Thanksgiving, but I uh, did not succeed. I uh, just ended up eating a lot, and that's about it. <laughs> so, well, that's what happens. There you go. 855-853-4802, uh, our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Jump over to our first uh, story of the day. It says, my uh, grandmother still lives in the house her and my grandfather built Back in the 50s, before the house was completed, a pool table was put in the basement and the rest of the house was erected around it. We'll come back to the pool table later. It's the house my mom and her sisters were raised in and it's a house that I love dearly. Now, I never got to meet my grandpa. My brother, who is eight years older than I, had a fantastic relationship with him, though. He was a loving man, passionate about his family. The guy everyone wanted to be friends with, an army vet and an avid pool shark. My mom and aunts were raised playing pool and were taught by the best. My grandfather passed away in the late 80s. I didn't come around till 92. He lost a long battle, battle with cancer and left my family. Now my grandmother remarried. She married my grandpa's best friend who had also just lost his wife. Let's fast forward to 2007. My family and I moved back to Idaho from Florida and are staying with my grandma until our new house was finished being built. My parents, myself, and my, bro my border collie, Bailey, are living with my grandma for two weeks till we can move into our own house. I'm a freshman in high school. I'm a big girl now. I can stay at the house by myself. So my parents and my grandma leave the dog and me at the house to head to Costco. As always, grandma locks down the house like Fort Knox. Excited to be by myself, I grab a can of Coke and run down to the basement with the dog to play a game of pool and listen to music way too loud. Being raised in a family of pool sharks, I was confident in my abilities around a felt top, even if it's just me playing. So crank the tunes, pull the triangle, and start racking. My favorite stick to use is my grandpa's blue aluminum pool cue. Arrow straight and just heavy enough. 
My dog is crazy, so he heads the ball, or he, here's the balls rattle on the table, and he's already running around the table trying to play. So I chalk up my cue and line up my break. And crack. Poor break. I knew it. My dog knew it. Grandpa knew it. Putting the stick down on a short bookshelf housing a picture frame, I walk behind the far end of the pool table and into the back bedroom, into the bathroom to pee. Washing my hands, music still on, but I can still hear the balls moving. Worried that my dog had jumped onto the table and he's messing with him, I run out of the room yelling his name. I get out to the table. My dog is lying under it like it was a kitchen table. The balls had been repacked into the perfect pattern, tight, no spaces. North and center. Pool stick is leaning against the table, not lying across the shelf where I left it. Feeling the hair on my arm stick up and my heart pound in my chest, I turn off the stereo, called for my dog, and booked it up the stairs. Shaking like a leaf, I rip open the back slider door. My dog and I wait out in the backyard till my parents and grandma got home. Telling my family what happened after they got home, my parents looked at each other, and my grandma looked down at me and simply said, Well, babe, he wanted you to try again. That was the first time my grandpa Vernon communicated with me while at the house. I think that's a good grandpa return story. I love that story. Yeah. Yeah, I hope that she did eventually, like, not get all freaked out by it and played a game of pool. Mm -hmm. Because, like, poor grandpa is like, I racked him up for you. He walked away. I didn't mean to scare you. <laughs> but... I just think that's a really cool story. It is. And it, what it, it, beyond just it. just the, you know, it's grandpa coming back. It made me think about something that was common in, in some of these older homes is I, I remember going to, you know, it was actually my, my grandparents' home, but they had passed before I was born and the house had stayed in the family, rented out for years, and then the renters left and then my family decided to finally sell it. But it was the first time I actually got to see my grandparents' farmhouse where they had lived. And I remember going down to the basement and it was a very narrow uh, s concrete steps in the garage to get to this little basement room very dark, dank uh, space. But in there was this pool table, this gigantic pool table that was probably built in the, the 50s or the 60s, just heavy as heck, you know, just this monstrosity piece of furniture. And I was always like, how on earth did they ever get a pool table down here? Because you couldn't get it out. It was there. Yeah, how did they? And it, But this story kind of said how that was done. They built the house around the pool table, knowing they wanted a pool table there. And I think this set was built before my grandparents had the house on my end. But it, I think this was probably a common thing back then of, okay, we're going to put this in and we know we want the pool table. And the only way to get it through the doors and through this or that is by building the house around it. So I think it was more common, uh, or it was a fairly common practice if you're going to have a pool table back then to build a, around the, the house around the table itself. Did what I loved about that story, too, was that that love of pool that you have to love pool a lot if you're going to build your house around a pool table. <laughs> yes. But that love of pool went down to her because she said as soon as grandma left, she got the, the soda, went downstairs, mm -hmm. all excited to play pool. Yeah. And I just think that's a very sweet story. And he was there watching and, and yeah, helping the way he I could. I love that one. Thank you for sharing that with us. The phone number here is 855-853-4802. Of course, if you like our program, please support it. Become an EPP, extra podcast person on our website at ghostpodcast.com. Get all the advanced episodes of the show and the EPP bonus episodes. Um, be sure to check out those previews. If uh, you haven't listened to the previews lately, um, we put the preview out every single week. Uh, it's the first about 10 minutes of the episode that you get and you can see how the feel of EPPs have changed um, much for the better. It's a really cool way of presenting these ghost stories. So check it out if you like it. Five bucks a month gets you access to all those episodes. Next story says, hey guys, my name is Tia. I'm from Huntington, Indiana. I have had so many encounters with the paranormal in my life. This one I'm going to share with you is one that I believe was avoidable, but my dumbass friend didn't want 
to listen to me. Okay. So from a very young age, my grandma used to tell me that visiting a grave of someone you don't know was not only disrespectful, but bad luck, especially if you weren't visiting to pay respect. One day, my friend wanted to see her grandma. So we were walking on the road to get to her grave, and we passed on uh, we passed uh, uh, the tombstone of a gentleman. It looked like a statue of some kind, but the statue was cracked. My friend said, I want to see what's in there. And I said, don't just go find your grandma. And, and did she listen? No. She goes, looks in and says, hey, there's nothing in there. I said, well, you get back over here and find your grandma. She said, I don't understand where you get that it's disrespectful to go to someone's t- grave site. And you don't know. I said, it's bad luck, too. You can't tell them. So therefore, you don't disturb them. So we start walking away and I start hearing footsteps. I said, do you hear that? And she said, what? And then she said, I listened to my name and I I could hear it being said. I said, yeah, I heard that too. I'm talking about the footsteps though. We continue to walk and she understands them also. She takes off running. I'm a bigger girl, so I don't run unless something is chasing me. And I start booking it to this girl who's a cross-country runner. She's a pretty fit girl, and I can run fast. And she keeps looking behind herself and calling after me. I finally say, hey, I'm beside you. Get to her house thinking we're okay. No, we're not. I put her kid to bed, watch the haunting of Molly Hartley. So we settle in to watch this, and I kid you not, all of her toys start going off. She had this Elmo that was a motion sensor you had to push on its stomach to get it to start. You go through a set of commands, Elmo up, please pick pick me up, and so on. The Elmo continued to go off. You put it down, it would say thank you. It would repeat if you did what it said. It cycled through about three of those. And if you left it alone, it would say Elmo says bye now, then shut off after those three cycles. And then it would turn back on. Her tickle the Elmo chair would shake around and giggle. When she sat in it, it was on the floor, and it was going off with no one in it. The door kitchen toy, lights and sounds all going off. I looked over at my friend and said, Do you see what happens when you mess with the shit you shouldn't? A few days go by, and we hear the girl upstairs laughing and saying, You're funny, Grandpa. We call her name and nothing. I told her I'm sure it's what followed us to her house, and I didn't feel scared or uncomfortable, so I think she's okay. Fast forward a few years, another little girl comes into the family who also starts playing with Grandpa. My friend gets pregnant again. She miscarries this little girl. And we're sitting around crying and grieving the loss of when the oldest says, Mommy, Aunt Tia, I want to tell you my sister is okay. She's with Grandpa. Mind you, we never told her about the baby. They moved and I assume they left Grandpa behind because we haven't heard about him. But that's one of the stories I have. I'll write it with more later. I love the show. Keep up the good work, guys. I never heard the disrespectful thing at a cemetery, but I suppose it's kind of, uh, it's passed down. Some families have it, some families don't. I never heard that either, but I kind of think it makes some sense. Yeah. I think I'd be really screwed, though, because I'm always the one that's in the cemetery if I'm looking at stuff. And especially if you're at one of those cemeteries that has the semi-above ground graves and maybe the tops kind of cracked over a little bit. I'm over you there don't. peeking and, you know, never, I, I, you know, I, I can't say I've ever been in a situation. I mean, today you have your phones and your, your flashlight. When I was it, exploring cemeteries as a kid, we didn't have any of that. So, but today I, it'd be really easy with, you know, getting a camera in there or something. Well, okay. So since like now that you've heard that's a thing, yeah. next time you do that, do you think, I could be bringing this home. Uh, I'm not scared. <laughs> you have kids. They have toys. That's true. You know, we did. Like the haunted Elmo thing that, yeah. like, I think that would totally freak me out with that creepy little, because that <coughs> Elmo voice is creepy anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We did have a toy that would go off by itself. And it was it was one of those Melissa and Doug toys, like the the puzzle where you put the the airplane in and then it makes the airplane sound or the fire truck in and you know, just kind of fit the piece into the puzzle deal. And for whatever reason, this was at, at our old house when we were in, in Wichita, uh, it would just go off and it'd be really bizarre. It would be in the toy box. Nobody would be around. And all of a sudden, this thing would just be triggered. And it, it was triggered by magnets when it was being played with. That's how it it knew to go off. And we're like, why is it doing this? 
Come to find because you'd been at a cemetery that day, being disrespectful, and I was peeking in the graves, and I took home a souvenir. Um, but uh, no, I, but it turned out what it was. It was something with the electromagnetic energy of a light switch. I don't know how this works, but, but there's energy there. And how I, did you figure that out? Because I I learned that when you I don't sound that, I know you, Tony. You no, that's <laughs> I, I learned when I flipped this one light switch, it would always go off. So I just sat there and I and I, I I flipped it a couple times, and every time it triggered the toy. And it's not like the toy is plugged in or anything like that. It was just simply the energy of the light switch shot a wave of or just a slight magnetic wave or something across the room and that's what triggered the toy now am i saying that's what's happening here in this case doubtful with that much going off for no reason um but that stuff can happen without it being a ghost and that's what we discovered so there you but go. it could be a ghost. It could. Be, I think it's a ghost in this case. But uh, we had that experience. We were because for a little while we we're kind of like eh, something, something going on here. So eight five five eight five three forty eight zero two is our number at Real Ghost Stories Online. It says, "Hey Tony and Carol, greetings from California. You guys are great. I hope uh, to one day hear this story on the air. I don't know if the following story classifies as paranormal. It was a dream that I had a long time ago. I've never told anyone about this, but listening to your podcast has made me rethink if it was more." than a dream. Please let me know what your guys' thoughts are. First, a little backstory. When I was six, my brother was seven. We lost our mother to fungal meningitis. It was not only a devastating loss because she was only 28 years old, but because she left two children and a husband who had a tough time dealing with her passing. See, my mom was the spark of the family. She was always the funny one, the extrovert, the loving and doting parent. And when she suddenly wasn't there one day, none of us knew how to deal with all of that including my dad, shut down emotionally and kept to ourselves. Anyway, before I continue, I feel it's important to state that I am not a medium or sensitive or an empath or anything of that sort. I can honestly say I haven't seen or heard anything paranormal, only a couple of dreams here and there of deceased relatives, but it's hard to say if there's any message in any of them. So anyway, here I go. For weeks, maybe months after my mom passed away, I want to say I was close to being clinically depressed. Losing her was the worst trauma I had and have still gone through. I was in a huge state of denial, and I thought that any time my mom would walk through that door again and say, I'm back, but it never happened. I would cry for her every night. My dad didn't know what to do with me during those nights. He would eventually allow me to cry myself to sleep in his arms. One night, however, I had a dream of her. In my dream, she walked up to my bed where I was still sleeping and gently woke me up and told me it was time to get up because we had to go places. Looking back, this was something that she did often. She'd wake me up with a song or kisses, and when we were going somewhere, she would get almost as excited as I would get, even if we were just going to the store. She enjoyed getting me excited. So going back to the dream, I remember looking at her and saying, Mom, you're not dead. I had a dream that you died, and it was so sad. To which she responded, Dead? Well, clearly I'm not dead. Now get up and let's get ready because we're going out. I didn't realize it during the dream then, but everything went in to black and white. My happiness chose to ignore how odd that was because I was over the moon with excitement. There wasn't much interaction with her. I remember getting off the car at the store. My brother and a few of the neighbor kids were also with us. We were all holding hands in a big line walking towards the store, and I was so carefree and happy and excited. The moment I questioned why nothing had color, I snapped back awake. The contrast in emotions when I woke up was so astounding that I still remember it to this day, 23 years later. I'm not sure what to make of it. Was it just a dream I had because I missed my mom so much? Or was there something there? Or was it that my mom wanted to come back one more time to give me a chance to be with her one last time? I don't know. Thoughts? Sorry to make this longer than it is already. I want to comment about how much I enjoy Tony's random singing. I crack up so hard only to rewind it and crack up all over again. Please continue singing. <laughs> Love listening to both of you. Keep up the great work, Denise. Well, when you have something like this and you're going through loss and, and grief and denial, it sounds like, and that's all part of it. It's easy to to have, I think, a very vivid experience in a dream where you feel as if the person is actually there. It's impossible for, I think, me to say this was her visiting, this was not her visiting. Sometimes that's only for you to decide uh, who have gone through it. Sometimes we get those little tidbits, those little pieces of evidence 
outside of the dream that make you say, okay, there, this shows there's something else going on without any sort of you know, denial. You just can't explain, you know, how did this, uh, you know, favorite dress or something show up on the hanger on my bed or whatever, um, that otherwise was not there. Um, but th- I think this is a very personal story that it's hard to say either, or if it was her coming back or not thoughts. First off, I'd like for you to break out into a little Michael Buble. Birds flying high, you know how I feel. There we go. Continue on. And secondly, (laughs) I absolutely 100% think that was a dream with her mother in it. I think that was her mother. It was a visitation. And I think that that you know it. Mm Mm-hmm. And and there's no other way. Only she can decide what it was for sure. But I think those are so different from a regular dream. Like that feeling you are with that person. Mm -hmm. And it's usually like not only are you with that person, it's it it has some kind of degree of comfort or you know, I'm here for a little while, or there's some kind of maybe a message to it. Sure. But I, I 100% think that was her mother, you know, cause her, she needed that. And I'm so, mm-hmm. it just makes me so sad that she lost her mom at such a young age, sure. but, and, and it sounded like her mom was this person who was so full of energy and had such a great spirit anyway. Of course she wouldn't want to connect with her daughter. Yeah. You know, I know I, I agree. I believe that, you know, all that, you know, you want that to be there. And I, that's why I think when you have things like this, it comes down to it doesn't matter if, if I say it's real or you say it's real or not. It's a matter of how real did it feel? And, yeah. and, and you have the, the individual How different does it feel exactly. from your other dreams that you have? That was my next point. It's it's you know, you can identify and only you can identify how real your other dreams are. And if this one was that dramatically different, you're the only one who's going to know truly was this something different and, and, and paranormal? And, and, you know, if, if that's the answer, then that's the answer. And it doesn't matter what anyone else, you know, thinks about it. It is neat, though, when you do get the little extra nugget of evidence, though. But um, it's a but personal I think thing. That, you know, I think that I, I don't know. I mean, there's no like, here's what happens when you die. And here's how they sure. can contact you. There's no booklet. But I, I just think that there are ways they can connect. You know, some people it's real, it's easier to get through to some people, Sure. but other people it's easier to have to get there in a dream. And I've just had those dreams and it, they were just so different. And so like when you wake up, you felt like you just were with that person. It's just different than a regular dream. Yeah. I, I have not had one, so it's hard for me to relate to that, but I totally believe you. <laughs> and, and obviously, you've heard a lot of stories here. And I, I someday I hope to have one where I can go, okay, I get it. I know what you're talking about. And then I'll be, It'd be te- so cool if you did. Yeah, I'll be texting everyone at three in the morning. Yeah. Just had one. I had a dream. Yeah. But hopefully, maybe, maybe the uh, it'll be a new enabled skill in Alexa before I have the dream where we can just do that. And uh, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online. Let's go to a caller. Hi, you're on Hey there. there. Hello. My name's Kelly. I'm from Michigan, Canton, Michigan. And I'm a real estate agent. Love your show. I love listening to it. And uh, always gives me the creeps. And when I'm walking my dogs through the dark park at night. Anyway, so um, I just thought this would be a good one to tell, among others. But... I, uh, I'm a real estate agent, so, <clears throat> excuse me, I was showing um, a couple with a four-year-old houses, and I the first couple houses I had met them at, um, cute little kid, he was kind of, you know, into his own world, and uh, hi- kind of hyper, didn't, <clears throat> didn't relate, didn't talk to me too much, because he's kind of shy. Um, anyway, the third time I'd met them, they said... Uh, they said that their four-year-old had asked before they came to see me if my dad was going to be there again. And uh, we just brushed it off, thought it was funny. But then when I was actually walking my dogs in the park that night, I realized that the day I went to show the house to them that third time, 
um, or the, the second time before he had asked about it, my dad being there, um, we'd had a really bad time in our family. My, my nephew actually was um, held up a hospital in a small town, um, and uh, the town was under lockdown. It was pretty, pretty awful. He had been um, prescribed opioids at 15 years old by a well-known doctor in New York State who was actually arrested a month before this happened to him and to our family. Um, but that morning before I showed him the house, um, I had come across a stuffed animal that my mother, my father has passed away from Alzheimer's. Um, but she had made us all teddy bears with his house coat material. And I'd found the teddy bear that morning when my nephew was in trouble. And I had prayed that my dad would look after us and um, be with us. And I always keep a picture of him on my dashboard, actually. And I talked to him a few times that day. And I was walking the dogs and realized that he had, that's the day he had asked if my dad was going to be there. And <clears throat> I called his parents right away and I said, I just wanted to let you know this is what happened. And it really shocked me when I realized what he had asked. And, and the, the father actually answered the phone and he said it didn't surprise him at all that his son talks to people, sees people all the time. So I just, uh, I just uh, thought that was a sign that my dad really was there looking after us and all well that ends well <laughs> it's getting better and he looked after us so all right thanks and i will be listening it's always a pleasure thank you bye-bye what are your thoughts on that one well number one that really got to me when she said she keeps the picture of her dad in her car and she talks to him because i don't keep a picture of my dad in my car but i talk to him in my car a lot okay and I know, so something about that whole story just kind of got me in the heart. Sure. Is it kind of, let me ask, why is it your car? Why is it, why is that the place? Because um, for me, my dad was the one who kind of, he didn't teach me to drive, but he taught me how to drive Mm -hmm. as far as like black eyes and the things that mattered. Sure. And my dad would be like, don't ride the clutch and things like that. And so I've always kind of, and, and then a lot of times for me, that's when I'm by myself and mm-hmm. things are quieter in my life when I'm in my car. Sure. And so, so yeah, I kind of love the fact that she has her dad in her car with her. Because talk about a guardian angel you want when you're driving. That's your dad. Yeah. I, I love the, the fact of just how nonchalant this was, where is your dad going to be with us again? And it's like, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> and you connect those dots and go, oh, my God. That's wow. That's that's some confirmation there that that she needed too at that at that moment in time of you know just some extra support when they're going through that tough time as a family. So and I, yeah, and that's so powerful. Yeah, and I don't because yeah, there are coincidences and there are things that aren't coincidences. You know. Yeah, I I completely agree, and I'd say that that surely one that was beyond just a. Uh, a coincidence. Thank you for sharing that story with us. Let's get one more call in here today. Hi, you're on there. Hey, this is uh, Ben Resnick from Virginia. Uh, I was just calling to let you know about a story that I heard from a good friend of mine. He uh, does this uh, ghost hunting thing. Uh, he usually goes goes around and finds haunted houses and stuff. And uh, him and his friends got to and. They decided to set up like a computer and everything in this house, and they had the they, they had the lights on, and there was a upstairs like it was it was a massive house. Um, forgot where he said it was, but uh, anyways, uh, they gotten everything situated when they started hearing thumping noises in the upper room of the house. And so they 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 decided to go up there, and um, well, there was nothing in there, but the light bulb had busted and shattered all over the floor. So it it, it really freaked them out. But then when they went downstairs, their computer had been completely smashed, ripped out. But 
there was like it was all over the floor and when they uh, put it back up it kicked on even though it wasn't plugged in and it start it was making all sorts of weird no- like the the screen wasn't smashed it was it was just lying on the floor un- uh, unhooked um and it started listing names it started listing their names i won't mention them here just for uh safety purposes but uh and then it had other names besides it and they had red lines marked through them and a little date when like like as if they that was the day when they had died and it was really really creepy um they 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 ran out of the house but right before my friend ran uh got out the something reached out and grabbed him and this guy he's like a miniature bodybuilder he's pretty strong but something grabbed him and almost pulled him back in even though he was he was pulling against it and he he saw an, uh, a withered hand holding on to his arm and he barely shut the door in time and got got away the hand fell down to the ground and disappeared before they before he could stick it in the bag that he was carrying um. Yeah. So that's my scary story. And, Thanks for listening. And that's why I wouldn't Bye. ghost hunt. <laughs> you know? Now, obviously, you don't you don't get that stuff all the time. But there's just it's an interesting thing where you have cases where things are almost like violently like uh, trying to prevent you from capturing anything, and then sometimes it seems that. They are more than willing to participate because they want the attention. You just don't know what you're going to get. And but, well, okay, so <laughs> I'm a little skeptical on yeah, that. Yeah, because like the withered hand. And it fell to the ground before he could put it in his bag. Who I, put a withered you know, hand I, in their bag? I'm thinking that part. This is obviously this is a secondhand story, um, so it's not the peop- person who ghost hunted that was telling the story. I'm guessing maybe the story was told, and I felt like a hand grabbed me and it looked withered, and I ran out and it, it you know it, it disappeared. And then maybe the friend who's retelling it is kind of ending up embellishing it a little bit more, not really fully understanding exactly what happened. So I'm going to kind of write that part off as this is a secondhand account of something that happened because the rest However, of the, the rest yeah, seems pretty. We were talking last week or the week before, if it was a nicely manicured hand. Exactly. Maybe then you'd be like, not so scary, but withered. Now, wouldn't that be scary. great? <laughs> like, I don't even know what a withered hand is, actually. I guess that is an I old gotta, wrinkly I hand. <laughs> So, I mean, I, I don't think he was I, I, that end part there with the hand in the bag. I'm again, I go back to I think okay. it was secondhand account. But the other stuff with the equipment being messed with. Yeah. And that's like that's when I'm like, what the hell? Why do you do that? Yeah. Because then I'm like, it's going to stick to me and come home with me. Because I just <laughs> don't it that kind of like. The computer falls to the ground, and then names are coming up. I'm out. Yeah. Uh, and my computer can stay there. I don't care. I would be really paranoid of bringing objects back that had been messed with and, and manipulated, although that's most ghost hunting equipment, and if you're going to be ghost hunting, you, you're wanting your equipment to be used by these things, and it's just kind of an assumption that goes along with the territory. But again, it's why I am sitting here in a room in a non-haunted house, Telling the stories <laughs> and not out there capturing the stories. Oh, God, no. There's no, no way I could do that. No, it's just not. No uh, way. Not, this, this is how I, I like to be involved. Uh, 855-853-4802, the phone number you can call 24 hours a day, seven days a week to share your ghost stories with us. Of course, if you like the program, please become an EPP, extra podcast person on our website, ghostpodcast.com. Get the bonus episodes every single week, advanced episodes of the program. You get access to those as we make them. We post them, uh, video content, e-copy of the book, Lots of great stuff when you sign up to be an EPP at only $5 a month. Check it out. Ghostpodcast.com. Keep our program on the air. Live dates up there. Uh, at least one is up there and tickets uh, information up there on the website as well. We're ghoststoriesonline.com. Until next time, for Carol Hughes, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for listening to another episode of Real Ghost Stories Online.